Right. It is exactly one o'clock. And we're going to go ahead and jump right in so we can squeeze every ounce of time from our, our guest today. Uh, everyone, I'm Daryl Minus. Uh, I'm the VP for Student Services at Southside Virginia Community College. And I am excited to welcome all of you to our second of three Profiles in Black Excellence virtual fireside chats during the month of February. As we celebrate Black History Month, this series is all about recognizing Black men and Black women who are inspirational examples of Black excellence, people who have not only accomplished a great deal in their respective fields, but have also committed themselves to impacting others. So with that being said, I am so pleased to introduce Professor Jeremy Duru as a guest today. Uh, I call him Jeremy, so I'm going to stick with that today. And Jeremy, it's Jeremy and Daryl today. That's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, Jeremy is a professor of law at American University. He completed his undergraduate education at Brown University and then completed a joint degree program at Harvard University, receiving a master's degree in public policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government and the Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. He is the co-author and author of several of his field's premier texts, including Advancing the Ball, Race, Reformation, and the Quest for Equal Coaching Opportunity in the NFL, which examines the NFL's movement towards increased equality of opportunity for coaches and front office personnel, Jeremy represents the Fritz Pollard Alliance of Minority Coaches, Scouts, and Front Office Personnel in the National Football League, and has previously represented sports industry professionals in employment matters involving other leagues like the NBA and Major League Baseball. Jeremy has a particular interest in sports impact on society with a principal focus on racial and gender dynamics. So without more delay, welcome Jeremy Duru. How are you, sir? Um, great, Daryl. Thank you so much for the incredibly kind uh, introduction, generous introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Uh, and those um, and the audience should know that uh, Daryl and I grew up together. Essentially, I've known them since I was 13, 14 years old. So to be able to participate in this series um, and this conversation is a real honor for me, and I uh, appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to chatting. Well, that honor goes both ways, sir. It's great to see you and so good to, to connect. So we're going to jump right in, Jeremy, because I, I, as I mentioned, I'm going to use every minute of time with you today that I can. Um, you know, as a starting point, I don't think it's a coincidence that you've become a notable voice in the sports law arena. Can you talk about your childhood and your upbringing um, and as well as some of the influence and impact of sports in your life? Sure. Um, so uh, sport has been a huge part of my life. Um, and I've had an interesting uh, childhood and upbringing. I was born in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, as a small boy, moved to Nigeria. My father's Nigerian, my mom's American. And so lived in Nigeria as a small boy up through, uh, you know, kindergarten, six years old or so. Uh, and then came back uh, to the United States and grew up in Tacoma Park, Maryland from then going forward. And I say that because that experience as a young person gave me an appreciation for the world beyond this nation's borders, um, for a different cultural context, um, and, um, and for an appreciation uh, of Africa, which at the time, uh, in the days when Daryl and I were, were young, um, Africa was, was uh, something to be made fun of. Uh, there wasn't a real appreciation for the beauty of the community, for the achievements. Um, that have come out of the continent. And so um, I got, I had an appreciation for it that I, that I 
that I felt was really important growing up. So here I am, I'm back in the United States, a Nigerian American kid, a black kid growing up. Um, and one of the things that integrated me back into this country when I had this weird accent and I was coming from a different cultural context was sport. It was soccer. You know, I played there. Everybody plays in Nigeria. Um, I came back and was better than most kids on the playground. And so suddenly I had acceptance. Suddenly I was somebody with some value, some merit in the eyes of others, you know, and the, you know, the, the playground can be a rough place if you don't, if you've not established yourself as somebody, uh, you know, who deserves some level of respect. And so that allowed me to, or despite the fact of being different in many ways, that allowed me to, to be a part of the community. Um, and then growing up from there, you know, through sport and principally soccer, I had exposure to so many different people, so many different perspectives. I went to a high school, Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, there was a major majority of people of color, um, except for a magnet program that brought in a population of students from a more affluent part of the country, uh, county who were majority Caucasian. Um, and I played on the soccer team with everybody, people from different countries, of different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ideological approaches. And you had the opportunity to get to know people through a common endeavor and get to know them beyond labels and beyond uh, presuppositions and beyond prejudices. I um, mean, so through that experience, um, you know, I just learned that sport can be something that brings people uh, uh, together. Uh, Nelson Mandela said sport can change the world in one of his most famous addresses. And I truly believe that to be the case. And I found sport to be deeply valuable in my experience. You know, that's such an awesome comment because, you know, when you just talked about sports almost being an equalizer for you and being able to sort of merge that with learning diversity and learning how to move into arenas of acceptance with other people, tolerance, understanding, yep. you know, that's a, a, a strong benefit of that, that sports uh, experience. Did you play other sports besides soccer? You know, I have to put you on the spot with that because I know you were more than just a soccer player, sir. Yeah, and I did. I did play other sports. I played uh, basketball. I played uh, baseball. I didn't run track. Should have run track. Would have been. Would have made me better. Should have. Uh, was that? I should have. Yeah, my son runs track, and I just, you know, I was so naive. I didn't realize that you could become so much faster through technique at the time. Um, but also, I played soccer principally. I played uh, a little basketball, a little bit of baseball. Once I moved into middle school and I started playing more competitive uh, travel soccer, there was kind of a pressure to play most of the year round, which incidentally, um, I, a lot of my study engages youth sports and I think it's a real mistake. I think it was a mistake for me to specialize at the time. I think it's a big mistake for kids to specialize so early. Um, so I played other sports, but I found myself as of middle school really gravitating toward and in some ways being pulled by the pressures of, of youth travel sports towards soccer. So you, you progressed through middle school, through high school. As you mentioned, we both went to Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring. Uh, so after high school, you went to Brown University. Yes. Um, and so upon entering Brown, were you already pretty sure about the direction you wanted your career path to take? I, I, I was pretty sure I wanted to be a lawyer. I had no sense that I wanted to be engaged in sport as a part of my career, although I should have thought about it because I loved sports so much, but I, I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Um, I found at some point in middle school, in fact, my older, I'll never forget this, my older brother, who you know, Kenrick uh, Darrell, he, um, I don't know where I heard somewhere, but I heard um, in eighth grade um, of Malcolm X. And, um, but, I, but I, you know, it was a weird sounding name. I didn't quite you know, know who it was. And so I asked my brother, who's Malcolm X? And he looked at me like I was a fool and said, I should go find out on my own. <laughs> it's called learning, <laughs> learning. <laughs> so I went and looked on my own and um, learned about Malcolm X. And, um, you know, of course, at that point in my education, I learned um, about Martin Luther King and the bus boycott and Rosa Parks and, and this independent study I did with respect to Malcolm X further strengthened my understanding of the context and 
I just grew to really enjoy uh, civil rights and the study of civil rights. So I knew I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer, but nothing beyond that. When I went to Brown, Daryl, I just wanted to, to make it. I mean, I, you know, all these kids who, uh, you know, from these big time New England prep schools, boarding schools and all that. And I'm coming from Montgomery County Public Schools, which is a good school system. Um, but, um, you know, I felt probably a little bit insecure, you know, to start. Um, and so I just buckled down my first semester and really didn't do anything but study. And I achieved that semester. And I think that allowed me to get rid of imposter syndrome and recognize that I was there for a reason and that I could compete. And once I had my feet on the ground, I set, set about seeking to move toward becoming a lawyer. That's, that's an awesome perspective. Um, you know, you, you talked a bit about being exposed to Malcolm X and big shout out to your brother. Definitely, definitely on that, on that aspect. Um, can you recall any other defining moment when you think about your, your wanting to get into civil rights? You know, was there something that really, in addition to what you may have read, just impacted you and said, wow, you know, I noticed the disparity. I'm, I'm hurt by what I see on an emotional level. Was there a thing or a couple of things that just, even pushed you more into wanting to learn more about civil rights and injustice? Um, you know, I think there was an experience I had when I was very young, I was in second grade, I'll never forget. I watched Roots with my mom and my brother and I was far too young to watch it in my own view. You were two? No, I was, I was um, second grade. Second oh, grade. second grade, okay, thank yeah. you. I, I, Not two, yeah, two. Glad I heard that. Like, That'd be like abuse, but no, I was second grade, so I don't know what I was, seven or whatever. And um, it scared me. I had nightmares. I was afraid to walk home from the bus stop. I mean, it just, you know, and while I was too young to watch it, in my view, um, it, it, it just struck me. I, I couldn't understand why there should be or couldn't be such cruelty. It just didn't make sense to me. I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. It, it wasn't rational. It wasn't reasoned. Um, it, it was damaging across community. And I think you know, maybe that sense of how unjust humans could be uh, perhaps always stuck with me. And so as I, as I grew and got more exposure to, to you know, the civil rights struggle, um, I just became uh, committed to being involved in it in some way. So that's a great segue actually, because you, as you mentioned, you buckled down, you finished your education at Brown. You know, talk a bit about your transition to Harvard Law School and how that experience further focused your lens and then were there obstacles that you faced on that journey? Talk about that because that must have been a very defining experience for you to go to Harvard Law and move through that process. Yeah, sure, Daryl. I mean, there were a couple of aspects to it. So when I first finished Brown, I first went, you mentioned that I got a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government. And I, I had earned a scholarship to go there, a full tuition scholarship um, to study policy. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, but I participated in a summer program, policy program, and I got the scholarship as a consequence. So I felt I had to take it. I mean, how could I turn it down? So I went to the Kennedy School. And when I got there, um, I found that policy wasn't really what I wanted to study. I wanted to, I wanted to explore policy, but the study of public policy is a study of quant, it's a study of statistics and economics. Um, I'm not very good at it. It's not what I really enjoy. And so I struggled in that first year at the Kennedy School. And I remember I was hanging out with a buddy of mine and I happened to see on the floor of his apartment um, an application, he was applying to Yale Law School. I said, why are you applying to law school? He said, yeah, I said, is it too late? I, had low, I, you know, I, just, I wasn't focused on law school at that point. I figured I'd finish Kennedy School and then do apply, focus on law school, but I was so desirous of doing what I wanted to do. Uh, he said, no, nah, no, nah, you know, the LSATs in, in um, three, four weeks, applications. Are... So I said, okay. So I then just buckled down and decided I'm going to push to try to apply to law school now. Um, and I applied and I got in, uh, I very fortunate to have gotten in. And that allowed me to transition from the master's program to a joint master's in, in JD. 
and I began my, my JD the following fall. So I say that to say this, um, I was so excited to be at Harvard Law School after spending that poor period of time studying what I didn't really enjoy. I should point out, further in the second year of the MPP program, you get into the more substantive um, you know, aspects of the work and you know, what it is you wanna deal with, health or labor, education. Um, uh, but I just struggled getting through the first year curriculum. Um, and so when I got to, I was just so happy to be doing what I knew I'd want to do for a long time that I didn't feel, I didn't feel trepidation. I didn't feel intimidation. I was just so gung ho about being there. Um, and, uh, you know, and I dove in, you know, jumped in both feet, uh, really again, like I did it at, at Brown the first, I think the first semester of, of law school, Daryl. I went to one party and it was just a little house party gathering. It wasn't even really a party. And I went to one movie. <laughs> other than that, all I did was study. That's it. Both because I was excited about it, as I mentioned, but also because I knew that it was, that I was dealing with some heavy hitters, you know, and I wanted to be able to compete. Um, and after the first semester, I kind of got, again, my feet under me and felt a bit more comfortable and was able to branch out a little bit and really enjoy the entire experience, not just, you know, the nuts and bolts of particular doctrines and contracts and property and such. Jeremy, you know, as you were talking, there were two powerful things that, that just stuck out to me. You know, one was your experience in the master's program and sort of that initial stumble that yeah. you had just getting your sea legs and, you know, navigating some things that you weren't necessarily great at and figuring out how to push through that, which yeah. is, I think, a great, a great lesson for everybody listening because you're going to encounter sometimes aspects where even in the scheme of what you're trying to accomplish, you've got to push through, but you may not, not be great and you may have to work towards that. So that was one thing that just struck me. The second thing is, one party and one movie. That, that is, what a perspective that is, because thinking about the rigor, thinking about what you, what you had chosen to do, that was probably almost necessary, Jeremy, wasn't it? To really yeah. just put that focus in. I felt it was. I certainly didn't want to be in a position where I looked back and said, wow, you know, you had this opportunity and you squandered it. You didn't work as hard as you could have. I didn't want anybody to be able to say that about me and I don't want to be say it about myself. And so I just, you know, I totally dug in and, and yeah, for those listening about stumbles, I mean, you know, uh, I'm at, you know, I imagine a lot of students uh, who are listening. And so we're talking about folks, maybe in late teens, early twenties, maybe mid twenties and further on. Um, but certainly younger than Dale and I are for the most part, I would suspect. Um, but there are always stumbles. I mean, I remember, I remember you're bringing it all back to me now, Daryl. I remember my roommate also had the same fellowship. He had the same scholarship, my roommate. And he also was, was an ad for the program. And along with the scholarship came a $9,000 stipend just for living and whatever. And we sat down one night and we're like, you know, we could just drop out and take our $9,000 and just get in the car and drive across the country and try to figure out. I, I mean, we were talking about it. And you know, I even, I called my mother. I said, I'm not happy with this program. I'd like to, you know, to stop. And she, her view was, no, you can't. She said, you know, you make it through this semester, come home at Christmas, and then we can talk about it. But you're not just going to walk away from, from the semester. So, yeah, no, it's, you know, stumbles are everywhere, you know. And uh, the question is, you know, getting up, that's the issue. We're all gonna fall, but you know, how do we get up and what manner do we get up? And once we've gotten up, what do we do next? A absolutely. So do you feel, and of course this is hindsight now that you're, you're done and you're now moving in your space in multiple levels. Um, did you feel that experience really equipped you, Jeremy, at, at Harvard Law to really, once you were done, did you feel like, okay, I'm armed with the tools I need to dive into this next chapter of what I'm gonna do with my career. I did think so. I did think so. And I'll say this also, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that I really buckled down and worked hard that first semester, 
Um, it, I was not, I did not blow the roof off of it that first semester. I did okay. Um, I got better as I went along through law school. But I remember after that first semester, I'd worked so hard and I did fine. But I didn't do really well. I remember thinking to myself, okay, I have two options. One is to conclude that I'm a decent, I'm an average student, you know, um, uh, or the other is to fight back against this and say, no, you know, I'm going to get the best of this curriculum. And, and that's the approach I took. And um, I think it can't, I think that, you know, confidence played a big part of it in two ways. One, I had confidence coming into the experience, perhaps because of my experience at Brown and just, you know, growing up. Um, but two, getting back in there and battling and having a better second semester gave me new confidence. And so this brings me to your point, which is, yeah, the, tra the, the legal training certainly was critical to um, what I'm doing, what I've done since what I'm doing now. But just the confidence like you know, I came out of there, you know, I feel like, you know, I can contend, bring what you got, I can contend, you know, I'm not going to be um, you know, I'm not going to be on a panel of folks and feel like I'm not worthy of saying just as much as everybody else. So. Absolutely. Hey, thank you for that. And your transparency is wonderful. I really appreciate, as I'm sure our listeners uh, do too. So at, at what point did you recognize that you had an interest in combining, you know, your passion for sports and, and civil rights and other areas? Well, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, I got very lucky, you know, I was, was lucky or just fate, you know, I certainly feel blessed, you know, I, you know but all, you know, all brought together, I, um, I, I, I worked after law school at a big law firm, a big defense side law firm doing commercial litigation. It was not anything to do with, with civil rights. It was just representing one big company against another big company. And while I improved as a lawyer, I certainly wasn't, I couldn't, you know, I wasn't enjoying it. And so I left there to go and do what I wanted to do, be a civil rights lawyer. And I applied in different um, contexts. I remember I applied to uh, an education law firm, got to the finals, um, didn't get that job. Applied to another one, you know, got to, didn't get it. And I applied to an employment law firm. And I, and I was, you know, I was disappointed having not gotten those first two. I applied to an employment law firm and I got the job. And Daryl, as soon as I got there, the lead partner said, listen, I know you just got here, but we've got this matter with NFL coaches. There's coaches in the NFL. They feel like they're being prevented from becoming head coaches on account of a many factors, including race. They feel, feel the racial headwinds that are stopping them. Um, can you work on the matter? And it literally had not occurred to me before then that I could marry these interests of mine, that I could marry you know, sports interest with my civil rights interest and work at that nexus. And so I did not realize that I could do that, Daryl, until then. So it's not that I sought it out. Wow. It just fell to me. And at that moment, um, I concluded I'm embracing this. I'm grabbing on. I'm going to do my best work. I'm going to try to build a sports law practice here. Um, and, and, and try to spend my career doing this sort of work. Um, and I, tell, I told you about the other two jobs I didn't get before that because, again, more transparency. I was crestfallen when I did not particularly the education law job. I think I would have enjoyed it. I was crestfallen. But had I gotten that, I would not have gotten this. And I'm so happy with this um, that that was a lesson, that sometimes things happen in the way that they're going to happen. And you hold on too tight you know, you may not find, you know, you may find yourself going in a direction that that isn't the direction meant for you. So, um, so yeah, that's how I, that's how I came to this intersection of race and sports and law. Wow. Wow. And it's amazing because people see where folks end up, you know, they see your trajectory and see where you are now. And it's amazing how sometimes there are events, there are circumstances, there are things that happen that you really, you know, you're not, looking for specifically, but the fact that you were ready to accept that yeah. and walk through that door, that, that changed your whole trajectory, didn't it? Your whole yeah. perspective. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's, you know, it's because, 
you know, life meanders in interesting ways. I think the key is what you just said there, which is to be open and prepare to embrace what comes. And if you see something that comes across your plate that you're really interested in, then that's when you seize it. You know, there's going to be luck. There's going to be chance, you know, but when you see something that you really, you know, inspires you, you know, you may have happened upon it accidentally, but you seize it and you run with it if possible. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, for those of you who are listening, you, you may have seen Professor Duru on TV. He is a media personality. CNN, go down the whole list. Um, and you've probably seen him as one of the more important voices and distinguishable voices in discussions about the NFL's Rooney Rule. And so we happen to have one of the foremost experts with us today on this very important rule and all of the things that surround it. Um, Jeremy, for, for those listening today, would you mind just explaining what the Rooney Rule is and maybe what prompted its development? And then maybe talk a little bit about you know, your perspectives on its effectiveness and even limitations. Sure. Um, so the, <clears throat> so um, let me give you some context as Please. to what what prompted it? And I'll tell you about the rule. So, um, you know, it, it's it's it, it should be no um, secret to anybody that that our nation is one. You know, it's been beset with racial discord. Um, that's one of the great challenges. They call it the original sin of America, right? Um, is slavery and what followed it. And so, um, uh, and basically, all institutions are stained by it including the National Football League. So the National Football League um, didn't let, well, when it started, there were a couple of black players in the league, this is 1920 now. And somehow in just the second or third year of the league's existence, this guy named Fritz Pollard, who was a player, became a player coach and um, took his team, the Akron Pros, and now defunct team, but they were called the Akron Pros, took them to the championship and um, became, and was therefore the first black uh, head coach in the National Football League. Well, some years later, all Blacks were expurgated from the league. Totally. Players, a few coaches, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they didn't come back into the league until 1946 and just in trickles. By the time you get to the, toward the end of the century, the late 1980s, the trickles had expanded substantially and now you have uh, a playing base of between 60 and 70 percent uh, African-American players. But you still, since Fritz Pollard in 1921, did not have another African-American head coach until Art Shell got the job with the Los Angeles Raiders in 89. Everybody thought that would be um, the harbinger of things to come, um, of progress. Um, uh, uh, he did well. He got to the FC Championship. But in the years that followed, there, maybe there was up to two head coaches of color, down to one, up to three, down to two, down to one, kind of going back and forth. And let's remember, and we're talking about a league with 32 clubs, 65% right. players of color, one head coach of color. So you get to 2002 and 2001 season, you had Tony Dungy, who's now in the Hall of Fame. He was with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and um, Dennis Green, one of the greatest coaches in the history of the Miami Vikings, uh, the, the um, Minnesota Vikings, excuse me. Um, uh, they were both head coaches. They both got fired after 20, uh, uh, 2001 season. And a couple of lawyers said, what's going on? We're back down to one head coach. This doesn't seem right. These two guys, Dungy turned around the Bucks, and uh, Dennis Green had extraordinary success with the, with the Vikings. Let's look into the numbers. Hope I'm not giving you too much detail here, Daryl. No, Hope this is perfect. Right. Keep okay. going, sir. Love okay. it. So they said, well, let's figure out what's going on. It appears though black coaches are the – uh, last hired and first fired. So they went to an economist at the University of Pennsylvania, asked her to run numbers going back 15 years from 2001 back to 1986 and assess the win-loss records um, of black coaches, the few black head coaches that had had the role in those years uh, against the win-loss records of the white head coaches. And 
as anyone who follows professional sports from the NFL knows, that is the metric. Do you win or not? Win, win or not? And they found that in the first year of a head coach's tenure, black head coaches won 2.7 uh, more games per year than white head coaches. 16 game season. So almost three more games is statistically significant. It's a lot. In the year of termination, black coaches won 1.3 more games than white coaches. Overall, they won more and went to the playoffs as a, uh, as a higher matter, as a, as a higher percentage matter. So the conclusion was not that black coaches are somehow inherently better coaches than white coaches, because that's not true. Um, the conclusion was that black coaches had been confined to assistant positions for so long that they simply were better. They had more experience and more expertise. And so when they finally became head coaches, they just were better. They outperformed. <clears throat> so the lawyers took this study um, to the National Football League and said, this is a problem and we might sue you. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about it. And the NFL, to their credit, brought in the lawyers, sat down, they talked. The NFL concluded it would create a um, workplace diversity committee of owners of clubs. The committee was led by Dan Rooney, the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, that committee, working together with the lawyers, um, uh, came up with this concept that um, every club should interview at least one person of color before making a hire for head coach. And because Dan Rooney had been the strong force inside the league for it, it came to be known as the Rooney rule. So that's the rule. You interview one person of color before you make a decision. Uh, a four head coach. And it was so successful in the early years, um, the number of head coaches of color went from one to eight over the course of just three years. Gen and then the NFL was so pleased with that progress, they implemented it with respect to general managers. And the numbers there went from one to six within a few years. Um, and so we had great success with the Rooney rule early on. Um, but since then, excuse me, there, there's been some raw, you know, some substantial um, uh, decline or drawback or backsliding, um, which I can talk, I'm happy to talk about, but let me turn it back over to you, Daryl, if you want to take me in any particular direction. No, no, no. You are right on track, sir. Please continue. Continue. Okay. So um, the rule was um, having a positive effect. Um, but a few, on a few, now, so let's think about the rule, everybody, right? So this is a state of mind rule. The idea is you have to make, you have to interview a person of color and consider them for the job. Well, nobody is putting a polygraph machine on the arms of NFL owners, right? So whether an owner is, um, is interviewing a candidate of color with a true eye toward considering that candidate of color, um, nobody knows. And so the consequence is that the rule is open to manipulation and to sham interviews. And so we started to see the rule being flouted in spirit. Candidates of color who were not by anybody's assessment ready for a head coaching job being brought in to interview quickly on the back of an end of an interviewing process where the club knew exactly who they wanted to hire, all this sort of stuff. And so, um, and so, and, in the, and on a few occasions, so you had that, you had flouting of the spirit of the rule. On a few occasions, you had flouting of the text of the rule. The rule requires that um, if an owner is involved in the interview of one candidate, the owner must be involved in the interview of all candidates. Well, we had a club uh -huh. where the owner interviewed the white candidate, but a lower level employee, general manager interviewed the black. So that's a, that is a violation of the text. So you have violation of the spirit of the rule, violation of the text of the rule. But in none of those circumstances did the NFL impose a punishment, notwithstanding the fact that this is a rule in the NFL's, you know, it's not just a, you know, it, it began as a handshake agreement, but then it became a part of the NFL's equal opportunity initiatives. I mean, it's a policy. And so once you had the, the, the clubs doing runarounds the rule, a runaround uh, of the rule, and, and the NFL not punishing those clubs, then I think the idea was, well, maybe this rule isn't that big a deal. You know, clubs are like, I want to get moving. I want to get my coach hired, start the next NFL year. I don't want someone else to hire. Let me just get moving. I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about the rule. And so it became cyclical. 
who was flouted, NFL doesn't punish, who was flouted more, NFL doesn't punish. And so we, we backslid into these last few years where we found ourselves back with a couple of years ago, one general manager of color, and this year, briefly, during the process, before the last couple of hires of the hiring cycle, um, only one head coach, uh, one, only one African-American head coach. So substantial progress and substantial backslide. Wow. You know, one of the things and just listening to you talk through the whole, what prompted its development and then moving through the cycle of success, seeing some good, some good trends. And then, as you mentioned, this whole backsliding, going backward scenario, I think just, just hearing you talk, one of the things that I've heard from, from many people who really don't understand the intent, and as you mentioned, the spirit of the rule is that it's, you know, it was a quota system. It was just designed as a quota system just to meet some benchmarks, but that's, that's not what it was designed to do, right? That's correct. That's correct. I mean, let's think, so what it was designed to do, so there are um, sociological studies that, that tell us that when you get two people together and you get them, to, and they can be from whatever background, experiences, and you get them talking about something of mutual interest, then a respect will develop, a rapport will develop, each will take the other more seriously, each will have a, a more positive view of the other. Just get them talking about the same thing. And so the idea behind the rule is you get the club owner together with this football coach and get them talking about how to make this team better and you will start to have personal breakthroughs. And, and, and the decision maker will start to see this individual as a real candidate for the job when before they may not have even brought him in the door. Mm. And so that's the intent of the rule. And I think it is a solid concept. Um, there's never any quota system in terms of the hire. Once you have the interview, you hire whoever you want on whatever basis you want. The, the rule is just about um, uh, the interview. And so if you have a situation, Daryl, where the um, decision makers recognize the value of casting a broad, a wide net, looking in a broad pool, considering people from all experiences to get the best, then the rule works. It makes the club better, makes the league better. But if you have an owner or an ownership group that just wants to get whoever they want to get, then you know the rule is flouted and it doesn't make uh, anybody better. And so it, uh, you know there's no quota system. Um, the idea is to open up the eyes of the interviewer, the decision maker to someone they might not have considered earlier, and that's it. And if the interviewer's mind is truly open, they will have a better outcome. Who goes out to you know I, you can tell any you can draw you know any sort of um, uh, 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 analogy, you know, metaphor, anything, you know, let's, you, if you're going fishing, are you going to fish in a third of the pond? You're going to use the whole pond. That's you know, right. if you're going out to, to buy a new suit, are you going to look in a third of the store? Or are you going to look in the whole store? It doesn't make sense to limit yourself. It's irrational. And the rule was designed to get people to recognize that if you explore the full um, swath of candidates, you are better situated in getting the best outcome. Thank you for emphasizing that. You dove deeper, which I think is great because that, that approach really applies to every sector, every industry, every workplace. I think now is having those same conversations, Jeremy, about how to close equity gaps, whether it's the students looking at diverse hires to make sure that they reflect the communities that people come from, so, you know, this, this, is a, this is a monumental discussion that has impact in so many ways. So just to kind of close out this piece, you know, you, you wouldn't advocate for scrapping the rule because I've heard, I've heard some people say, well, you know, you look at it now, it's not working, take it off the table. I mean, that's not what you would suggest, is it? No, no, I wouldn't suggest that. I think that would be a mistake. Um, uh, what I think needs to happen is clubs need to implement it properly and the league needs to come down on clubs. I should point out, remember I told you about those two lawyers. Yes. Who learned that study. They came to the National Football League. When they came to the National Football League, 
they came with this idea. They called it the, um, uh, the fair competition resolution, roughly the Rooney Rule idea. Um, and in their proposal to the league, they said, and we can see kind of three ways for it to gain traction, be enforced slash gain traction. One is that a club that has a strong record of equal opportunity interviewing and hiring gains additional draft picks. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, a club that fails to abide by the rule um, gets fined monetarily. And three, a club that fails to abide by the rule loses draft picks. And the league was totally, and I talk about, and you mentioned advancing this ball, advancing the ball. Was, the book Advancing the Ball is all about this struggle. <clears throat> and I talk about it in there. The league, they were apoplectic about the draft picks. They were like, there is no way we're connecting draft picks to this. That was their view. Draft picks in the NFL, for those of you who are hardcore NFL fans, Draft picks are gold. I mean, you know, you know, and, and the club was like, there's no way, and the league was like, there's no way clubs will go for this. So they they ended up using the fine as the penalty. Um, well, maybe you step things up now. Maybe you do uh, employ draft picks, um, but in some way you find a more substantial uh, manner in which to ensure that clubs are implementing the rules. So I don't think the rules should be scrapped. I think implementation and um, enforcement are, are keys. With that said, Daryl, I also do not believe that the Rooney Rule should be the only equal opportunity initiative in mm -hmm. the league's basket. You know, I'm a believer in every oar in the water, every idea on the table. Um, uh, and so, uh, you, know, you know, keeping the rule does not mean um, uh, refusing to contemplate other suggestions, other ideas, other proposals. In fact, I think it's critical that other proposals and suggestions and ideas be considered. Yes. I think they should be brought in tandem with this rule that is strong at core rather than throwing out the rule and starting fresh with all new initiatives. Absolutely, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, let's switch gears again, because I'm watching my time. As I mentioned, I'm gonna use every minute to get some good information from you, right. sir. Yeah. This and I hope that all those that are listening are enjoying this today as much as I am. Um, you know, as somebody that deals with students on a regular basis, you know, I spent my last 20 plus years working in higher education. You know, I, I always have a lot of fun relaying, you know, wisdom, you know, lessons learned, tidbits to students, or even to challenge them, you know, to think differently, diverse points of view. You know, I get a kick out of that. It, it helps motivate me, you know, in so many ways. So as a law professor, you, you have to have those kinds of cool exchanges with your students. Yeah. You know, and I think about some of the topics that I'm sure you all cover in class, civil rights, discrimination, ongoing battles with injustice, all of the stuff we see in our social media circles. You know, talk a bit about what some of those experiences have been for you in the classroom, Jeremy. What do you like most about teaching, you know, in those moments? Yeah, so, um, you know, I do love teaching. Uh, I just feel so, you know, so fortunate. One thing that we were talking about my, um, my path to becoming, you know, to working at this intersection of civil rights and sport, and I kind of stopped when talking about my work at the law firm. Um, what I didn't talk about was my transition to academia. And so um, I'll tell you what took me in that direction. I, um, you know, the thing about law, is as a plaintiff's lawyer, which I was, um, there's something called Rule 11. Right? And so rule, rule, 11. <laughs> rule 11 is the frivolous filing rule. And what it says basically is that you have to come with a legally sound argument. Um, and then there's the rule called 12B. And 12B says, and you have to be able to state a claim for which relief can be granted. So these rules together basically say, you can't come to the court with uh, you know, a totally newfangled idea and expect to get anywhere. It's gotta be basis. And I found that, Daryl, a little bit restrictive because <laughs> um, you know, if all you're doing is working with the law as it exists, how do you get to truly new and innovative approaches? And so, um, 
you know, you can litigate a line of cases over the course of a decade or two decades and get incremental change. But I wanted to explore ideas that were, you know, outside of the realm of what I could do in a lawsuit. So I thought, well, academia is perfect. That will allow me to go and write books, um, explore my ideas in writing, and engage these ideas with students and back and forth in an intellectually rigorous and vibrant environment. And so that's why I got into teaching, was at Temple University for seven years and moved back to DC um, and uh, uh, an American. Um, but yeah, you know, I love, you know, what you described is what I love. I love the interaction. I love the engagement. I love challenging students with new ideas. I love being challenged um, uh, by students uh, with respect to, um, you know, their ideas and their conceptions of how we should consider issues of civil rights and race and, and, and sport. And I'll tell you that my, what I love most about teaching, I love the, I, I very much enjoy the classroom. Um, but mentoring is what I really enjoy. Mentoring is what I enjoy. Students who really want to follow in this direction and do sports related work, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly work at the intersection of sports and civil rights, but really sports related work. That's, that's what I enjoy the most. I love having deeper conversations than we can have in the classroom about what they want to do, about where they want to go, about their ideas. I love talking to them about the courses that they should probably take about the organizations they might want to reach out to to start developing an evidenced interest um, in the area on, uh, on their uh, resume. Um, I love um, uh, 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 guiding independent research projects where these students are really spreading their intellectual wings uh, and exploring the field in a way that no particular course will allow them to. You know, they get to write a paper for a semester on something of your choosing. So yeah, it's great. You know, I feel, and I and I know you feel the same way. Daryl, being in education is such a, I mean, it's just such a, a blessing and and so enjoyable and a wonderful way to spend a career, in my view. You hit all my buttons with that response, sir. All of them, <laughs> every true. single one. So we, we got about uh, maybe thirteen minutes left, and you know, I, I do want to kind of broaden our conversation for a few minutes, just a bit. Uh, we're, we're in Black History Month, you know, and you know, we're, we're aware of our surroundings and sort of how things have been progressing, you know, over the past, you know, 15 years or so. You know, when you talk about bigotry, you know, that, that's an underlying source of racism. It's been there. You know, so it, you can't really dispute that there's an existence of hate in this world. But you know, it's also my view that you know, inequitable economic, systematic structures, you know, that stuff plays just as much of a role in keeping the racism cycle, you know, going. You know, I, I have friends and you know, great friends, you know, you know, of all ethnicities, all races, all backgrounds, who often tell me, Jeremy, that you know, I need to think more about focusing on a, what a post-racial. America looks like, you know, one that, you know, is, is blind to the fact that, that we have these differences. And, and I agree to a, to a point that that's a great goal to aspire to. Um, but, you know, events over the last few years, especially, have given me a more realistic barometer of just how far we still have to, we still have to go. And when you consider things like George Floyd's death, you know, you, you talked about some of the inequities in sports and, and that can expand all across different spectrums. You know, what's, what's your, your personal viewpoint from your life experiences, from your professional experiences? You know, how do you feel about that whole context of what I just said as far as where we are, where we have to go? And I guess just to kind of wind, wind that piece up, you know, how can we keep framing the conversation in ways that build more bridges instead of like dividing humanity more? Sure. So, oh boy, that's heavy. I'm, I'm disappointed we have only 11 minutes on it. I know, I tried to save some space for this one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, um, first of all, you know, you spoke about just the, you know, out and out racism. So let's, let's, let's establish, first of all, that there are people who are out and out racist. They, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be the most irrational thing in the world. It's got to be. I'm, I'm not sure 
how one can rationally support the idea that I don't like this person because how they look. There's no, it just, you know, it's, it's totally irrational. And, and <clears throat> you know, that's just unbelievable. Um, you know, but moving you know, away from just out and out racism to systemic racism, which absolutely exists and to the idea of a post-racial America. And I think, you know, it's evident, you know, people said when Barack Obama was elected president that we had reached that point. Um, anybody who tracked uh, the number of uh, hate crimes um, and the development of hate groups during his presidency would know quite clearly that it was not, we're not in a post-racial America. Um, and what we have seen over the course of the last several years makes it terribly clear as well. Um, and it's dispiriting. It's dispiriting, you know. I'm 48 years old. I thought we'd be further along. You know, I remember when I was 18 years old, you know, and suddenly I'm 48 years old, and you know, it, it's you just, you're so worried about some of the same things. Um, I guess I would say um, one key thing. I, I, you know, one one thing that we've been exploring as of late. Um, in the public discourse is this idea that we should no longer really focus on, on history, that we shouldn't focus on um, the way things were, um, that we shouldn't uh, study something called critical race theory, which allow me to say, you know, I, there, this conversation has gone so sideways, it's unbelievable. I'm somebody who studied critical race theory. And, you know, critical race theory is not some sort of boogeyman. Critical race theory is thinking critically about um, this nation's racial history. That's it. Why do we want to ban critical thinking? I, you know, I, 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 we need more critical thinking. When we, when, you know, when we abandon critical thinking, we become automatons, then that's when we're in trouble. You know? And so I think you know, I am all in favor of us moving. I would love it. There's nothing I'd love more than us being in a world where um, there is no prejudice based on race. That would be the most beautiful thing I can imagine. But we're not gonna get there by forgetting about the nation's history. We're not gonna get there by ceasing to think critically. I think we get there by recognizing the history and thinking together, how can we move forward from the history? And we get there by thinking critically about how things have been and critically about how we can move forward in tandem and unity. So the current conversation that seems to suggest a reduction of exploration of race, I think is the wrong direction. I think we need an increased exploration. I think that helps us get to where we want to get to, which is a true place of unity, which I would, you know, I would be, you know, I'd be so happy if we reached that in my lifetime or the lifetime of my children. See, you and I could spend the next hour on that subject alone. We're, we're right at 153, and I, I could talk to you much more about this, Professor Drew. Uh, you, we share some very similar sentiments, and you know, whatever side you fall on in terms of the critical race theory discussion, you know, I, I think that that you bring out a very, very valid point, and it's you know, by and large, most people most reasonable people do want to see a post-racial America where we can focus on our strengths, on things that bind us together, you know, not see discrimination in the workplace or other places in society, have a playing field that's level, whether it's in education, you know, or, or otherwise. I mean, I, I feel like there are so many people like 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 us and others of all of all walks of life that want to see that happen, but I, I think your point is one that I want to want to definitely emphasize, and and drive home again. No, no matter what your own personal political viewpoint is, it's the fact that we we have to critically understand where we've where we've been, and where we've fallen, and where we can see opportunity to bridge that divide, and that only can happen through critical understanding from the things that have occurred and from the people that have experienced many of these things. 
And so I, I appreciate your candor and appreciate your perspective because it's, it's one that, that also speaks from the heart. Because I, I, I think these are also matters of the heart. You know, sometimes changing the heart can, can alter how a person treats someone else. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate that, you know, that, that perspective. Yeah, no, you're most welcome. And something you said, Daryl, I just wanted to emphasize, which was ahead, we have to explore our failures. And that's exactly right. You know, you know, the, it, you know, if you, you know, if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it or whatever it is they say. I mean, let's figure out where we've gone wrong as a nation, as one nation, as all people who are in this country in America. Let's figure out where we have gone wrong and let's go right. But if we don't figure out where we've gone wrong, then, you know, moving forward productively is difficult. So, um, you know, I should say also I'm a huge history buff. So that's, you know, it's, I mean, I love yeah, it. We didn't get to that this time, but we will. At yeah, some other time. Time. <laughs> well, Jeremy, you know, how, how can people stay kind of up to date on things that you're doing, conversations you're involved in, of course, picking up, you know, anything that you've written, which, by the way, you all have got to get advancing the ball, race, reformation, and the quest for equal coaching opportunity in the NFL. It's an excellent read. How can people find out more about what you're working on? Thanks, Daryl. So, you know, all of my books are available on Amazon, you know, and wherever, you know, I'm not, I'm not touting Amazon here, any bookseller, you know. Um, but I also, you know, I, um, I'm not the most prolific uh, uh, tweeter in the world, but I have, you know, become a bit more focused on trying to um, get some thoughts out there. So you can follow me on Twitter, which is at NJeremyDuru. <clears throat> um, and I'm on LinkedIn, you know, Jeremy Duru again, and Jeremy Duru on LinkedIn. That's where I do most of my public uh, 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 discourse. Um, and so those are probably the two uh, best uh, fora. But here's another one. How about uh, after finishing your education down there, you come to law school. Ah. You come to American University of Washington College of Law, and you take my courses, and you study sports, race, and gender, and disability with me, and, um, and we engage in that way. So uh, anybody who's interested in that path, you please let them know, Daryl, that I'd be more than happy to be, to be helpful. Well, you all heard that first right here. And we'll make sure that we even share this recording, Jeremy, with many others who I'm sure would love to view this and will that just didn't get a chance to join us today. So just to close things out, you know, Jeremy, I, I have to tell you what a pleasure this has been for me. Um, I, I've not told you often enough. Um, our circles haven't crossed, but you, you are such an inspiration to me. Uh, so many others, you and your brother. Um, you know, I just hope everyone listening today was as enlightened and encouraged by by Jeremy uh, as I have been. So, with that being said, any last words, sir, before we close things out? No, I'll just say, D, it was a real honor to be with you. Um, if if Kenrick and I inspire you, you and Eric certainly inspire us. So there's some some substantial synergies going on and uh, reciprocity. And so to have been invited to come and speak with your community is a real honor. And um, I don't take it lightly, I appreciate it. And um, you know, I wish everybody uh, who's listening to this the very best in their educational paths. I'd like to be helpful if I can. Thank you, sir. Best wishes to you and take care, okay? You too, Daryl. Talk soon. All right. Bye everyone, thank you for joining us today.